Greetings and salutations. I want to start by recognizing how disappointed I am to not be doing this in person and sharing this time and space with you. But we're going to make the most of it and there's a lot to get through. We only have 20 minutes, so, so let's go. I'm going to start with a little bit of an introduction about myself. I'll shorten the, the long version of my shtick here, but essentially been focused on open source infrastructure automation going back over 10 years. In parallel, I've been working um, in and around the DevOps community and, and writing books and talking about these kind of topics. And then I, I joined Red Hat about two years ago. This is just a picture of my peak pandemic beard. This has been shaved and you can see we're, we're almost back to that. And, and just to kind of put this out there, if anyone wants to get a hold of me, uh, LinkedIn or Twitter, that's probably the fastest way. And I come in various configurations of hair and beard. And if you see me anywhere else, uh, in, I might look very different than I do right now. So with that being said, I would claim no expertise in security. I've been involved in lots of things where security was a consideration, but it's never been my job, my responsibility, my name on the line for security. So take everything I say with, with that as a context. What I would consider myself is an aspiring pattern matcher and puzzle solver. And security has been a goal and a constraint, but it's never been exactly the thing that I was 100% focused on. So with that, I'm not going to talk about all the buzzwords of the day. The buzzwords, you know them. Uh, there's lots of other talks about them. Some of you are probably working on them. I would hope most people listening to this know more things or know more about these things than I do. But with that being said, I'm not not talking about those things either. Uh, what I'm really going to focus on is kind of the dynamics of how organizations change their behavior. So there's a couple things that I think are really not changed here in the sense that the, the basics are essentially, is there an identity that we can authenticate against? And then once we have those identities authenticated, is that identity authorized to do whatever uh, they're trying to do? So you have this kind of who, what, when thing that you both want to be able to enforce and then also record. And this has not really changed. Like the fundamentals of some of this stuff, um, in my opinion, isn't fundamentally changing. But what is changing is the, the dynamics of the tools and the dynamics of the, the problems we need to solve with respect to scale um, and, and the surface areas. So this is something that I think is very exciting about the way a lot of these tools are emerging is we're getting into this world where instead of the, the theatrics of inspection, we can move into some hope of a future where everything is, is verified by, by cryptographic identity and, and policies enforced based on that identity instead of the sort of theatrics that seem to dominate uh, what most people do for security today. So this is this notion of continuous, you know, we have continuous everything that's a buzzword, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna use liberally, um, not just in this talk, but in lots of other talks. So we wanna get to this world where everything is continuously verified. So then back to the topic of the day, or the topic for at least this 20 minutes, is there's this interesting question of how you can change from what you are to become this new thing, right? So the legacy, can it become cloud native? And when you think about that problem, there's the legacy applications, which sit on the legacy infrastructures, but underpinning all that and creating that, and in many ways, these things are a reflection of each other, you also have these legacy cultures. And I'm gonna introduce an idea here, which isn't, isn't something I'm making up, but there's this notion uh, of a socio-technical system. It's not technology alone that solves these problems, that de develops or delivers the imp applications, the infrastructure, or the security. It's that socio-technical system that does so. So you have to address that. So uh, too long didn't read. This talk is basically the change is hard. That's the title. That the point I've already started to make that security is qualitative. It's not a condition. You're not secure or insecure, but, but there's qualities that are more secure and less secure. Those are qualities of a socio-technical system. You have to treat that system as, as a single thing. If you think about it purely as a technical problem or purely as a cultural problem, you run into these things where it's very difficult to, to, to change or, or move past where you get stuck. And then this is sort of, sort of the new kind of ideas I'm gonna hopefully introduce that you'll find interesting and insightful is this notion of collective interest and selfish interest and how those come together. And then 
this is something I like to say, and sometimes I say it with swear words, but uh, broken things tend to get fixed, but things that are merely bad uh, can, can often live forever. So you want to change the world. We, we all want to change the world. This is an exciting time. We, we see all the advancements in technology. Uh, some, sometimes we get to make some of those. And uh, I just want to remind you uh, of, some of, the, some of the ideas from the past on this topic. So this is uh, Machiavelli, who some of you might have heard of, and maybe one day I'll give a talk that's just quotes from philosophers and, and uh, these sort of things. But I want to point out the, the, the sentence I've made bold here. So the innovator has for enemies all those who have done well under the old conditions. I'll leave the rest of it, and this is a pretty famous thing, but just think about that uh, next time you're having conversations in your organization about how to do the new things. And then related to that, and this is, this is from a different, uh, slightly different time around the, the, um, the, you know, the transition from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics. Uh, Max Planck did some, some foundational seminal work there. And, and this, is the, this is called Planck's principle, which says that a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light. Uh, but rather because its opponents eventually die. So the, the, the simple version of this is that science advances one funeral at a time. There's another dynamic which I want to point out, which used to frustrate me in a lot of the work I was trying to do, getting people to kind of adopt these new ways of working and, and do things in a better way, is that you, you have this thing that we're kind of a part of innovating. You know, I think that's something we can say is, is happening around the, the cloud native technology. So there's innovators there's early adopters and when they're doing that work, when you're creating those new things and you're adopting those new things, you're actually focused on doing things better, getting an advantage and then you see that advantage is de demonstrated. You see this in sort of the state of DevOps reports, some of these other things with, with, with automation and then you get into this early majority, late majority and you start to see this phenomenon where people don't actually adopt the real practices or in some cases even the real tools but they start using all the words and they start changing all the titles and this is this is studied um, as a phenomena um, which we don't have time to get into all the research um, here but what, what ends up happening as you kind of cross the chasm and come into the majority is that these organizations are not actually seeking advantage they're seeking legitimacy and the legitimacy is because there's other people who got the, the advantage but they're not, they're not seeking that. They're just seeking the words, and that, that's enough for them. They'll, they'll just take those titles, and now they're SREs or whatever, even though they changed nothing. So where were we? This is a blog post from Legacy Andrew in 2010 about what DevOps meant to me at the time. Uh, developers and operators can and should work together. System administration is evolving to look more like software development. And it's, this, is, this is last but not least, in some ways most important, is that this is evolving together as a global community sharing solutions. And I think that's the most exciting thing. Um, I think that's also happening with, with Cloud Native. And, and for all intents and purposes, I feel like these are a continuation of, of, of similar things, right? So this is my definition of DevOps I've used in many conference talks, that it's optimizing the human, human experience and performance of operating software with software and with humans, which is important in a minute. Um, and just to be completely buzzword compliant, you know, continuously DevOps micro serverless uh, will check a lot of boxes for the day. So related to this definition that I use for DevOps is this theme about software is eating the world, right? Like that is essentially arguing that software is optimizing everything it can, optimizing human performance and experience. And, and DevOps is really just an extension of that. Cloud Native is, is a, you know, another level extension of that. And what we're seeing, and what I would think a lot of this community is about, is that software is actually eating software, right? So we're seeing this sort of software, software platformification that's, that's allowing all of these things to happen. And I'm gonna go into platforms um, more and more deeply as we go, but the other thing that's happening, and this, this is really the point of this, this sub-conference here, is that software is eating software security. So we have this, this situation. People always say software is eating the world. I don't think that's entirely true. I think there's a lot of other infrastructure and circumstances that support that. So we live in this time. I'm speaking to you through the internet. Supercomputers everywhere connecting all human knowledge with high-speed networks. But it's also connecting all that to the adversaries. And 
I said this as my part of my definition coming back to it, every aspect of human performance and experience that can be optimized will be including owning you. So with that in mind, you know, DevSecOps, just to kind of rub um, the same pattern on it, and I'll say this now and I've said it before and I'll probably say it again, uh, DevSecOps is another buzzword of the day and it's really adding that, that consideration of security as a first class um, part of the equation. So security is involved um, to include and is included in the software development. So the software of security is looking more and like more like software development, like with the life cycle of software development, and it needs to be included in the rest of the software development life cycle. And then here's the exciting part that we're part of right now. Um, like I said, I wish I was together with you and we could do this a little bit more uh, it, it personally, but reach out to me. This is a, a global community sharing solutions. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have seen things I haven't seen. Uh, I'd like to hear about them. And if you wanna know my opinion on anything, uh, I'm not shy, so reach out. So this is a very famous quote from 2006. Um, I'm just throwing it in the middle of this because I think I think it's relevant to some of the some of the themes and what we're struggling with in a lot of these organizations. And and I'm not going to read the whole thing today, but you can you can read it, and I'll, I'll you know slides will be available. Um, but Werner Vogel's 2006, "You build it, you run it." People say that all the time. They quote that all the time. Okay, that's cool, but. Uh, who, who, who's actually going to secure it? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, might be a little bit of a problem. And if you look at the big picture of what Werner's talking about and what was it at Amazon at that time in 2006, Werner doesn't mean that these developers are going to provision bare metal, you know, get everything racked and stacked install operating systems, install libraries, install and manage databases. That's not what he means at all. What he really means is really that team of software developers manages this, this top layer. So I'm gonna go back through, this is kind of like a reprisal of some classic DevOps conversations. And this notion of traditional IT being a wall of confusion between developers and operators. And then I'm also going to introduce uh, some, some research from my colleague, um, Jave, in a minute. So these are two different games. So you can kind of think of DevOps as, as trying to win two slightly different games. Um, let's define what those are. So this is, uh, Jave's working on his PhD, so he likes it when people um, reference his, his language. And this is related to his, his PhD research. So you have this notion of what we'll start with, and we'll call two economies, two different games to play on the, the left side. You have what we'll call the differentiation economy. This is about innovation. You win this game by creating more novelty, by creating new variations. Um, you win the, the scale game, and this is not necessarily the words I would have chosen, but this is what's in the literature, and um, this is about efficiency. So you're, you're reducing variation, and, and this isn't unique to IT, right? This is just the, the nature of anything. So if you're trying to manufacture or whatever, you still have this tension, this conflict between innovation and efficiency. So. Just to oversimplify, you know, back to the dev and ops divide, you have create more value, drive down costs, and this plays out in lots of organizations as a tension between the, the business units who are trying to go faster, get more customers, do things differently, and the central IT who's trying to control consumption and, and basically reduce the variation. So this, this traditional framing um, with the wall of confusion between us sort of sets these two forces against each other. Um, but now we're adding another consideration, right? So if we're going to consider security, then we have, in, in a lot of cases, in a lot of organizations, added a new, a new wall of confusion, right? So you have these traditional forces. Developers don't necessarily understand security. Security doesn't understand operations. Uh, there's, in, in some organizations, if you get deep enough down this rabbit hole, you start to realize um, the security and the compliance people don't necessarily see eye to eye on some of this either. So this is an oversimplification, but for the sake of the argument, um, I, we're, gonna, we're gonna go with it. So these walls are there because we don't understand the other games that these, these other, these are people, we're all people, um, and we don't understand that they're connected together, that there's, there's really like one organizational game, there's one collective uh, that, we, that we're serving. So is there a way to win all of these games together? Uh, there's a new way, and I'm, I'm gonna start with this academic framing, hopefully get more and more concrete and, and hopefully more and more relevant. So this new game, and this is, this is from Jabe's language, 
um, is this, this scope economy. So it acts a bit like a clutch or kind of like a fulcrum that balances the differentiation and the scale economy to enable innovation and efficiency and security. And the scope economy, in the, in the best cases of this, results from these ongoing negotiations, recognizing the selfish interests in favor of the collective interests. So getting more and more concrete, you have, if you've optimized everything for innovation and you allow every single team to make all the choices they want, you end up with a lot of different, different um, and varied ways to do pipelines, to do you know, the object model, to do the databases, to do whatever. And that, that is great for the innovation, but you've created all this downstream operational burden for the organization. And you've created this like very broad and widening uh, attack surface from a security perspective. So it might be more valuable to look at those patterns that were innovative and look at the commonalities that might be reused across the organization and bring those into this central platform to be reused by everyone. And then conversely, you also see this in, in especially in, in heavily regulated organizations where the resources are overly restricted. And as a consequence of that restriction, you're not really getting innovation. And so figuring out kind of based on the risk and, and the, 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 you know, the policies that you can enforce with the platform, it might be more valuable to pre-audit and, and secure some of these libraries, some of these services, and bring those into the shared platform to be accessed and, and, and they'll be more valuable. So I'm gonna argue, I'm gonna assert every cloud native company it builds these platforms, um, has built these platforms, is building and extending these platforms uh, because they have to. You can't, you can't get to the scale and, and keep the promises that you need to keep um, if you're doing everything with this artisanal you know, hand, hand um, automation and, and security approach. So this is from the SRE book. This is the Google way. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm just going to read this, this bottom part. So development teams can focus on the business logic because the framework already takes care of correct infrastructure use. This is Google explaining uh, in, in some degree how they built their shared platform that's straight from the SRE book. Borg is a scope economy construct. Kubernetes is a scope economy construct. Yay. Uh, I also think it's interesting to think about. Kubernetes is an open source global commons to build a local shared platform commons. And then establishing an SLO is a commoning exercise between SREs and software engineers. So what is the equivalent negotiation for securability? What is securability? What are the principles of securability? I'm not sure either, right? I, I never said I know what security even is. It's never been my job. Um, but I, I do know a thing about reliability. And this is one of my favorite characters in that narrative. Uh, shout out to Joe Armstrong, uh, rest in peace, um, and Erlang. And this is the six laws of, of, of reliability. And I'm not saying this is the, the laws of securability, but it's not a bad place to start. Um, isolation, con con concurrency, failure detection, fault determination, live code upgrade, and stable storage. Uh, go look into some of his work and some of his talks on, on these topics. Um, and then this is me being silly on Twitter. Any sufficiently complicated microservice deployment contains an ad hoc informally specified bug ridden implementation of half of Erlang. I'll stand behind that. And again, this is my advice to you. Good DevOps copy, great DevOps steal. Whatever, whatever you want to call yourselves. But going back to the to the stealing idea, this is this is the chapters from the SRE book that I recommend everyone read, no matter what your job is, um, security, operations, development, whatever, embracing risk, limiting toil. Most of those ideas would translate into any domain and, and be a collective concern. Um, and then what would it mean to have a security level objective? And, and how would you measure that? And I'm not sure I have the answers, but I, I really like thinking about this and, and, and measuring this and being in a position to, to help organizations make progress. So. This is a, the same exact quote. The only thing I really changed here was, was the word security. So just to kind of read the same thing again, development teams can focus on the business logic because the framework already takes care of security considerations. That's the holy grail to me. So this platform that we're building, whatever it is for your organization, has to continuously and automatically audit and enforce policy because the old style of security and, and inspection and theatrics cannot keep up. Um, with this microservice world we're moving into. So how does that platform get implemented? Well, it's this notion of commoning and bringing all of these selfish interests that we all have into that platform, into that manifestation of our organizational needs, risks, 
um, need for innovation, need for, for efficiency, and, and building the right thing. If you get too far in one direction, you get out of balance, it doesn't really work, right? So if developers are running everything, then you're creating a lot of uh, operational burden. If operators are stopping everything or security stopping everything, you're not really innovating. So finding that balancing point by getting those selfish interests to negotiate with each other in favor of the collective interest. So this is the holy grail we want to get to. Developers can do everything to create novelty, to create innovation. You have this platform in the middle that keeps all these promises, provides self-service access with the enabling constraints. And underlying that, you have this securable and reliable compute networking and storage infrastructure. So that's simple. It's not always easy. Um, believe me, I know, and I'm sure some of you know, and you hear this all the time, you know, the culture is the hard thing, but, but it's, it's, yeah, it's hard thing. So security is also never done. That's another thing. This is an ongoing negotiation. Um, sometimes I hear people say this. I, I frequently hear people say this, um, which is like, good luck. Good luck with that. So just keep in mind, resistance to change might be the only thing more inevitable than change. And there's this, there's this dynamic, you know, where we don't want to forget how we do things here. That's what we are. This is how we do things. Um, and going back to this that I introduced you to earlier, my advice to you is to seek advantage. Always be seeking the advantage. So coming to the end, conclusion, this is not a technical problem. This security is not a people problem. Security is a socio-technical system, and you have to solve both of these together. I don't have time to learn new things because I'm too busy getting things done. That's a very famous quote by the least productive person in the world. And with that, thank you. I'm not here to answer questions. I'm here to have conversations.